message on uh, the coats of Joseph. And I will be, in a way, wrapping that message up today. We'll see. I think I can do it. I did it the first service. But then next Sunday, I want to go back into the life of Joseph, not considering so much his coats, which are symbolic of moments in his life that shaped him, but going into the the story of Joseph in such a way that you're going to get a depth you have not, most of you have not had before. And so you won't want to miss that because I'm kind of uh, skimming the surface of the story today, as I did last Sunday, Uh, but I'm going to go deep next Sunday. So be ready for that. I think there's a lot that God wants to speak to you guys uh, through that. So this is significant. The coats of Joseph. And I want to do a little bit of a review in looking at this as to last Sunday, if you happen to miss, and review for those even if you were here. And that is, uh, as we look at Joseph, we consider him as one of the greatest leaders in the Bible, and I told you, his story is my favorite. Of all the stories in the Old Testament, I love the story of Joseph. And, uh, and part of that is because it's a story of a family, and a family that is torn apart, but uh, ends up being healed by the power of God. And that speaks to me, and I think it speaks to a lot of us uh, in this room. And, uh, and I have had feedback from last Sunday from people who have said, Thank you for speaking in regard to family issues. And so this is a, a powerful story as we see uh, Joseph in, in, um, in the narrative. And so um, we also talked about how Joseph is an archetype of Jesus, meaning that Jesus did not come uh, on the scene for the very first time at Bethlehem. Jesus existed before Bethlehem. Remember, uh, in the Gospel of John, we read the words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus. Jesus was there in Genesis. Jesus is without beginning and without end, as God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is. And so in Genesis 37, let's look at that again in the first five verses. The Bible says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, uh, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, who's, who's also Jacob, we know that his name was then changed to Israel, but he, it's interchanged uh, as to how it's used. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to them uh, in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, They uh, hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. So we're looking at this family situation in which Jacob comes back to the place where his father had stayed. It's the land of Canaan. It is the promised land. And to come back in regard to uh, family and heritage is really to come back to his roots. And it's a place of promise. This is where Abraham was told that he would uh, be the father of many nations and that his offspring would, uh, would be beyond the, the count of the stars. And, and, and this is a place of God's promise. It's also a place where he's coming back, having made an excursion in his life, and so many things happen in his life, he's coming back to the place of his heritage. It is a place where he finds identity. We've all been assigned to a family. We didn't choose those families. Some of us perhaps obviously would have. Others would uh, perhaps have wanted a a little selection opportunity there. But we all have families that we have been assigned to. And here we see that Jacob comes back to his identity. And we just read about, and I spoke about it last Sunday, about this ornate robe. Another translation says richly ornamented robe. And as I mentioned to you last Sunday, that would be a robe that would be reserved for royalty. 
And so his father believes in him. Jacob believes in his son, Joseph. And so he gives them the, this ornamented robe. He doesn't give it to any of the rest of the sons or uh, anyone else in his family. He gives this to Joseph. And we could say he's overdressed. And here he is out in the fields and checking on his brother as he comes around in his royal robes. And this is an identifier. Again, the first coat represents, represents Joseph's identity. He is tied in identity to his father because this is his father's pleasure upon him, his father's hopes for him. And uh, he sees something that he can't really give the specifics to, but Jacob can see something that is special about this son. It ties to the identity of his father, and we see that with that first robe. Joseph is not uh, dressed by his father as to his environment or uh, any of his circumstances. He is dressed as to the calling of God on his life. Now, Genesis 37, 31 through 32 tells about how the brothers, after they have put Joseph in the pit, sold him off into slavery uh, and off into Egypt, how it was that they used this robe as an identifier. They bring this as an identity of uh, their brother Joseph to the father. The father now has what is a torn robe, and it is bloody, and he can see that that is the very robe that he gave his son Joseph. So he cries out. He's unconsolable because he uh, recognizes that the animals must have torn apart his son, and he believes his son to be dead. And in a way, we see this as uh, something coming home to roost because back in earlier days, jo jo uh, Jacob had... Uh, falsified his identity to his father, Isaac. And you may remember that story. And he puts the fur on his arms and comes to his now uh, blind father uh, who, who reaches out to see if that's Esau to give the firstborn a blessing. It's not Esau, it's Jacob. And he's conning his father into believing that he is Esau so he can receive the blessing. Now here he is being conned by his own family in this situation as that robe is used as an identifier. And in Genesis 37, in the 28th and in the 36th verses, I want to now go on with uh, the rest of this uh, narrative. In the 28th verse, we see, So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern or pit and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. And you'll remember again, I, I mentioned that uh, Joseph is an archetype of Jesus, and here he's being sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of mankind, will be sold for 30 pieces of silver in time. And we see so many references that are similar between the lives of Joseph and Jesus. And then in the 36th verse, Meanwhile... The Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt, uh, in Egypt, to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So Potiphar is not his name. It just basically means it can be translated an official of uh, the Pharaoh. So this gives a little bit of a sense for where Joseph is now. He's no longer in the land of his, uh, of his brothers and his father. He's no longer in Canaan. He's now in Egypt, and he doesn't know anybody in Egypt. And he must have been shaken in regard to his identity. And so Potiphar uh, sees that God is with Joseph. It's very interesting that Potiphar recognizes God's presence on him. And so what he does is he therefore trusts Joseph to have... Uh, control over all of his household to be able to take care of all of the affairs of his household. And so in Genesis 39, we read what happens at that moment. And that's starting uh, here with the uh, second part of that sixth verse. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And, you know, I couldn't really make this an illustrated sermon, but take a look at me and just get a sense, <laughs> just get a sense 
No reason to laugh that much, but get a sense that Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, okay, stop. My, it's my own family on the front row over here. Okay. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. She's rather direct. And so, and so this is what we see that is taking place uh, in his life. And you know, it's interesting if we think in terms of building blocks, uh, it, it's a challenge to be successful in life. And I tip my hat uh, to anybody who can gain success in this world. It's a, it's a challenging process. It rarely comes quickly. And in a career, it's a step up to one stepping block and then up to the next when one is seen as having been trustworthy, they can get to that next uh, promotion or level and then to the next and with each level is greater impact. And, and we see that in careers. It may be that the goals that one may have might be in regard to family goals and maybe they get married, maybe they have kids. We see these things uh, and we could name other things, but we see that there are these building blocks that are there. And sometimes uh, someone after a decade or two decades or three decades of these building blocks gets to a level where after a lot of work they get successful. But I can tell you that I have seen in my lifetime, when we talked about 30 years of ministry, uh, Lisa and I have both seen that there are those that reach these levels And it's amazing that with one thing being exposed, with one thing coming out of being hidden, it's like a meteoric fall. And we see it in too many lives. We see it in the headlines of today's papers. We watch it on the news. We all of a sudden, with what we thought was the image, something else comes out and we're disappointed. We're shocked. We gasp when we hear of the story of somebody who who just crumbles and falls, whether it be moral or ethical or whatever it may be. And here we see Joseph, and he has the opportunity, after after all, consider the fact that he is a slave. It would not be expected of a slave that a slave would be morally right. A slave would not be considered to have those senses of standards or whatever else. A slave can do whatever a slave would want to do, can do what, there's not great standards. Listen, Joseph knew at that moment, as he would see the opportunities that would be there, that there was something so precious and valuable that was inside of him, and it's the calling of God, and he would not compromise himself even though this opportunity was there. And I I know that Dr. Robert Clinton uh, did a study out of Fuller Seminary. It's one of the studies that I've looked at and and, uh, interacted with in my doctoral thesis. And it's a study of a thousand leaders in the Old and New Testament. And I believe it goes beyond into church history. But in looking at it, a thousand leaders that come out of the Old and New Testament and beyond, some of those we don't know anything more than their name. For some, we know their story. But in this study, it looks at these leaders and gauges whether in their legacy they ended well. Or did they get to a place where they got disqualified or crushed in their influence and impact? And in looking at it, this is the culmination of the study. Only one out of three end well. Only one out of three. So when we look at Joseph, he's an inspiration to us. I can't say that Joseph is perfect. It seems as if Joseph, in those early days, shared his dream in a way that was offensive to his family. And certainly we can see there was dysfunction there. The brothers were frustrated with the love that they saw the father had that was unique for Joseph. But even Joseph's father pushes back. When he first hears the declaration of that dream that Joseph had as a young man. So it's conjecture. We can look at it from all different angles and try and figure it out. But there may have been something there that Joseph had to work through and that God was working with him through. I know that only one perfect person ever lived. And his name is Jesus. But I also know 
that within this, if we look at the story of Joseph as he ends up in prison, which I'll get to in a moment, there's a period of time in which Joseph is not released when we would think he would be. Was God still working on him to prepare his heart and mind for the moment of the culmination of his legacy and use in the land of Egypt and to his family? I don't know. But when I look at Joseph, I do see that Joseph was able in his private life to match it up with the calling that was so unique and special on his life. Don't mortgage your future. Don't get to the place where you feel like, well, no one will ever know. It's just once. It's just a few times. Let everybody do it. Whatever it may be, don't mortgage your future. Because there's something so critically important that God has placed on the inside of you as a calling. And God wants you to be able to walk in the authority of that calling. And not walk as if you've never been saved. So I challenge you and inspire you with Joseph's life that Joseph was able to do that in his private life. And in Genesis 39, 10, we see she, meaning the the wife of Potiphar, she spoke to Joseph day after day. Now I want you to catch that because this is how the enemy works. And I want you to see how the enemy works. It's a drip by drip process. Think for a moment. You wouldn't think that the Great Grand Canyon, and I want to bring my family there. I've been there before. At least I think you've seen it. But but the girls have never been to the Grand Canyon before. I can tell you that you look at that, you see the majesty of the, the cavernous and how it's done, and to think that water did that. But that sense of of water that over and over and over again taps at the same place carves out mountains that you would think could never be marked in that way the enemy comes drip by drip the enemy comes just moment by moment and at first it can seem subtle and after a while it becomes obvious but the enemy tries to hit you oftentimes in the very same place over and over again Potiphar's wife comes daily and presses with her words. What does the enemy try to do? The enemy tries to wear you down and get you to a place where you get discouraged and you're in a season where you're willing to release that sanctity, that holiness of that calling on your life in order to just go ahead and fall to whatever it is. Remember the building blocks. In order for you to get from one stage to another to another, You want to be able not to crash and burn so that your family says, oh, you've got no moral authority on that issue. You've got no... Listen, God brings in healing and you can have a fresh start today and then walk in this anointing to where you know your calling and you know your identity. Can I hear an amen? Oh, I really want to hear an amen. I know it's warm in here. We had uh, uh, some sort of thing with the AC go out, so we're going to fix it. Anybody that wants to contribute towards that can. Okay, <laughs> Genesis 39, 11 through 12. The Bible says that he, meaning Joseph, left his cloak in her hand. Joseph would lose his coat, but he would not lose his character. And the second coat that I want to present to you that is significant in the life of Joseph is a coat that represents integrity the first one represented identity it was stripped from him now he has the second coat that represents uh, 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 integrity and he has it stripped from him I want you to see both are stripped from him but it doesn't mean that they're not of value in what they what happened in that course of time or season in his life because he needed to be believed in by his dad he needed to see the heritage that was in his family That was important. It was foundational with that first coat. But I can tell you, if he only remained in his identity being tied to his earthly dad, he never could have moved on to the power of his heavenly father with what he wanted to do in his life. He would have remained checking on his brothers in fields where he was in Canaan. But he had to have that release that was actually stripped from him. And some of you may feel like, yeah, I understand what that is to have something torn from me in regard to that type of thing with identity. The second one with integrity, he didn't lose his integrity. He didn't let go of it. But he allowed in that moment that coat to be grasped and taken because he knew that God wanted to take him 
to another place. And maybe he didn't know it. Maybe he just worked through it. But God was doing that. And God was all over his story at that moment as that was stripped from him. And I can't help but think his whole world imploded. I mean, he's being falsely accused. He finally gets into a good situation and it's comfortable and it's good and he's trusted. And the next thing you know, this is stripped from him. And everybody, I mean, his reputation seems to be gone. If you don't have your reputation, what do you have? And so here he is at this moment with everything seemingly imploding in his life. I want you to hear this. Even if you're at a place where you feel like it's all been stripped away, or you feel as if you've been attacked and hit and hit and hit, and you have done nothing wrong, for Joseph did nothing wrong, even when those things happen, I want you to know that's not synonymous with God judging you, condemning you, or leaving you. In fact, you can be in a place in which you're in the eye of the storm and everybody's coming against you and you can walk in the anointing of your calling with the favor of God all over you. That's who you are. That's, oh, I like the clap. Come on, let's do that. I like that. That'll keep me going. Plus, it produces airflow. We like airflow in this place. I'm up here with all the bright lights. I'm getting a tan. So, we see that those coats have been stripped from him. And, uh, and then we see that Potiphar is angry. What is Potiphar angry at? He's angry when he hears the story. Who tells it to him? His wife. I want to expand your thoughts for just a moment. Let me take you somewhere with me on this. Because we can move by that rather quickly. Potiphar is angry. With whom? Well, the obvious response would be with Joseph, of course. But I want you to think for a moment. Maybe. But I want you to think for a moment. The Bible says that Potiphar knew God's presence was upon Joseph. He could see the favor of God all over him. That's why he gave him trust. And we can see within that that he did give him all, I mean, he trusted him in all these ways. So when we see that he is angry, I wonder if he's angry with his wife. Because after all, she did this daily. And there's some sort of issue here. And Potiphar, being an official of the Pharaoh, uh, of the Pharaoh had every right. Oh, I'm going to talk captain of the guard. He had the power and the right to have Joseph executed, but he doesn't do it. And we know that in this prison, a baker will end up being executed. That power was there for the officials to use if they wanted to use it. He doesn't use it. He sends Joseph to a prison in which the elite are there, cupbearer and baker to the Pharaoh, the king. These indiv- he didn't need to do that. So when we see this and he sends Joseph away, I wonder if the one he's angry at is his wife. Now, I may be wrong with that, but it makes me think for a moment. You've got a ship. Let's say you're a boat, you're a vessel on the water. And you're going along and you know everything's just smooth riding, everything's great, everything's just going great. This is symbolic of your life. And then all of a sudden somebody else's boat comes by. And it shakes and gives ripple effects and you find yourself rocking on your boat. And maybe it's to the degree where your boat capsizes and you're trying to get it back up. Listen, there are moments in which the issues of others affects you. And you can be walking through life obedient to God, doing your best to serve him. And somebody else's issues rock your boat and you lose your job. Or rock your boat and all of a sudden it affects a relationship and you didn't see it coming and you don't know why it's coming and you wonder where God is and I can tell you that it was stated that when Joseph went into the house of Potiphar and it was stated that when Joseph went into the prison having been falsely accused that God was with him. So difficult times are not synonymous with God departing. And we've got a light theology if we believe that because somebody's under attack 
God has abandoned them or they've done something wrong. Instead of departing from people going through attacks, that our believers stand firm with them and walk them through. Because God is watching over us even in the most difficult of times. And I wonder, did Joseph know that God was all over him when he's being falsely accused? Was he aware that God was all over his story and writing behind the scenes and about to show him what he can do in his power and his might when he is going to prison without a reputation, without a, a person who seems to care in the world, and even his own family doesn't even know that he's alive, or at least his father does, and who would be the caring one. And so this is what we see is this anger that is, is there and that others have rocked his boat. And maybe that's the type of thing you never plan when you're thinking through the blueprint of your life, and you're not thinking about the other boats that come back by and rock yours. And I can tell you in my own life, I've known that. And there are moments in which you just have to stand with the integrity of God and walk through it and believe that God is working even when you don't know how. Because that is what God does, and he's a faithful God. Amen? And so Joseph, at this moment in prison, he learns a key lesson, and that lesson is that he used to uh, share boldly that, uh, that dream that he had. And he shared it with his family, and it seems like maybe it had a premature sense to it. But what we see in prison is that Joseph isn't sharing his own dreams. He doesn't say, people will bow to me. I can't believe I get the opportunity to say this to the cupbearer of the king and the baker of the pit king. Listen to the great sense of what God's doing in my life. Listen to the dream God gave me. It is so awesome. I'm going to be elevated. I'm going to be something awesome for God. He doesn't do it. Somewhere within this, he's learning a lesson, and instead of wanting to share his own dream, he focuses on listening to the dreams of others. And if you want to have a powerful ministry, I'll tell you how to have it. Don't try and convince people that God's hand is on you. Let that just happen. Instead, listen to the stories of people's lives as they share their dreams and aspirations and their hurt trails. And as they share the story of their lives, listen to it and then not only be a story catcher, intentionally catching people's stories, but go a step further than that and help to interpret it as to the purposes and will of God. So that people can see that God is all over their story and that God is moving and he has a plan for their lives. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, to prosper you and not do you harm. And that's what we need to do, and that's what he's doing. And he's learned that really is a progression of things that we see in his life as he's learned that. He has favor with the warden, and, uh, and he's making friends with these uh, officials of the pharaoh as well. And, um, and that's how you have impact. If you want impact in somebody's life, listen to their story and help them see God in it. And you'll have impact in the lives of others. The cupbearer is restored. And here he is now before the Pharaoh once more. We know the baker, not the best story. But we know he's executed. But we have the cupbearer back in prominence and influence and power. And right next to the Pharaoh. And right when Joseph must have thought, now I see how God's going to do it. He's going to bring me out of the prison. He's going to give me favor because the cupbearer, I helped him. I was able to interpret his dream for him. I, I, God, I did your will. I ministered life into him. I ministered wisdom into him. And now he forgets. And the Bible says the cupbearer forgot. And I think this had to be the lowest point for Joseph. He'd been through a lot of things, and I'm sure they were all low. Those moments of accusation, the pit, the Potiphar's wife, and the rest of it. But I believe the lowest point is when you feel forgotten and like God doesn't even care. Nobody cares. I'm all alone. And that's what he must have felt at that moment. And what you do at the moment when you feel that God doesn't seem to care, that you've done all that you need to do and you don't even hear the affirmations that you need from others or it's silent when you pray, in that moment, I believe the enemy thought, boom, I hit the death blow on him. I got him. But not Joseph. The Bible doesn't give us all the details of that. I'll go into greater depth on some insights next Sunday. 
But the Bible doesn't give us all the details of how he processed that. All we know is he remained faithful and was ready when the cupbearer remembered after some time. And it's believed that that period of being forgot, about two years. And I identify at moments in my life, I can understand, but I'm so thankful for the inspiration of what we see that takes place in what we believe is the lowest moment of his life. And then we see that there's seven years of plenty that will be, uh, that will be followed by seven years of famine. And in that, that's the interpretation. So the Pharaoh sees that this is one that knows how to interpret and is hearing from God. He sees that God's presence is upon him, just like Potiphar did. And if you think about it, the favor of God was there at every moment in Joseph's life. He had the favor of God when it was his family in that season of life. He had the favor of God when he was in Potiphar's house. He had the favor of God when he was in the prison. He had the favor of God when he was the leader of the land. And we see in this that there's a great sense that he can be trusted by the Pharaoh. Now, the 41st chapter here, the 41st and uh, 42nd verses. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. And he dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Joseph is now 30 years of age. He is over the entirety of the land and fully trusted by the king. And this is what God has done in his life. This third robe represents in Joseph's life his influence or legacy. And so we have the identity, the robe that was the richly ornate robe, as being the identity of Joseph. And then we have the next one that was the integrity of Joseph. And now we have the influence that we see. And he's over all of the land. And Joseph's brothers, as I'm kind of skimming this, and again, we'll go deep next Sunday, but Joseph's brothers came amidst the famine. And there's a moment in which, I mean, they're coming for food. They need substance. They don't recognize him. Years have passed. They assume he's dead, gone. They're not looking to find their brother. And when they have Joseph reveal himself to them, something happens. Joseph finally reveals who he is to them And he wants everybody gone and to shut the doors. He cries aloud and he weeps and he embraces them and he kisses them. Now that's amazing to see what happens, especially when we consider the fact that he had the power to execute his brothers, all but Benjamin. You know, he had the power to do it, but there'd be no reason. But he could go through the list of his brothers, bring them in and say, You're going to the gallows. You're going to be executed. He doesn't do it. Imagine the ability to say, bring me Potiphar, but especially bring his wife. And I'm going to take care of that situation in a very public way. There's no sign of revenge. There's no sign of retribution. And it makes me think of Jesus on the cross. As he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's just a moment of forgiveness that transcends natural, a natural sense of how human beings respond. And so we see that happening uh, there as to the influence uh, in his life. The Bible says that he kissed them and he wept over them. And, uh, And really, when you think about it, influence in our lives can go both ways. Uh, there's uh, an analogy I used in the first service of uh, Winston Churchill. When we think of him and his influence, we think of one that inspired individuals by his words, and he was able to hold things intact so that a ruthless dictator could not sweep through uh, all of the area, uh, through Europe and beyond and into England and beyond. And so we think of his influence, but then you also have to think that Hitler had influence too, didn't he? It wasn't good. But it was influence. And he wanted to use his influence for evil. And so all of this is influence. But I can tell you this. I see when people actually simply neglect their influence. I've watched as uh, through the years, Lisa and I have both seen. Uh, we're talking about 30 years of ministry. And so we've both seen 
that, uh, that there are moments in which parents in raising their children really hope that their friends and their teachers will get them straight. Send them off to camp. Get Jesus in them, please. <laughs> and I, we've seen that. And so it's this kind of thing of I abdicate my responsibility. But the reality is, is that God doesn't want us to neglect our influence to, to use that with our children towards righteousness. As a twig is bent, so shall it grow. Raise up a child in the way in which he should live. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so we cannot neglect influence. Every one of us have it. But many of us are walking through life as if we've never been saved when it comes to our influence. And we need to be intentional in that influence. And certainly we see that Joseph was. Jacob dies. The father dies. He's a great patriarch. And Joseph's brothers at that moment are scared that Joseph will now exact revenge upon them. Why? Because what they remember is the Joseph of that first coat. And to them, this is the thought that that first coat represented his relationship to his earthly father, his earthly father dying. Then at that moment, uh, Joseph just will let loose. On them because that's how they rem- they don't know that he's progressed in spiritual ways and maturity to a level where that's not what his response is going to be. He's not going to respond as if he's back in the old days in that way. In Genesis 50, starting with the 19th uh, verse, the Bible says, but Joseph said to them, this is his response when they're scared, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. Listen to him comfort them. Couldn't he have used comfort in that pit? Couldn't he have used the comfort when he was in prison? Look at him comfort the very ones who gave him no comfort. That's what he does. He says, I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. That's how he uses his influence as he responds in that way. What did we see in regard to Joseph? What did he do with his influence? He saved a nation. He was able to be an example before all the people of godliness, including the Pharaoh. He was able to show them what that looks like. He was able to heal what was a broken and dysfunctional family, and he could bring the healing on the scene. And he was able to forgive people even before they even asked to be forgiven. In Genesis 45, 22, in the first part of that uh, verse, the Bible says that Joseph supplied his brothers with new clothes. And I know the thought could be, Pastor, you're really getting every ounce of everything you can get out of this, but I want to say this to you. Joseph gives them what he was stripped, had stripped from him. He gives the very ones who stripped his coat from him, he gives them new clothes. Clothes in that day, in that culture, would be your identity. It would speak to who you were. And he says to them, here's your new identity. And he responds to them, not as the ones that put him in a pit to where they even wanted to kill him, except for one brother. They put him in the pit, they sell him off to slavery. Into slavery, they sell him off to a foreign land, and he doesn't even get a chance to grow up the way he should have with his family. He doesn't respond to them in that way. He responds to them by giving them what, he, what they stripped from him, and I love that. Stand to your feet, ask the worship team to come. What we see with Joseph, the archetype of Jesus. The one who shows us what the heart of Christ is like, what our God's heart is like, is he didn't condemn. So quick to forgive. So quick to believe. So the enemy comes with his deceptions and he tries his best to tell you that God's judging you. That's why something difficult is happening in your life. God's against you. Now, if there's ever a moment in which you know you've done something that needs to be repented of, repent quickly. But I can tell you the God that I know, the God I read about in the scriptures, is the God who brings healing to those who have broken hearts. 
There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Thank you.